two, three, maybe a fourth. They're coming out of his beat six and seven. Top the boy versus Brendan an eight. Oh, wow. No, no, no. Ten days till first class footy returns and the countdown to the NRL season proper is on as well. This is Supercoach 365. Ryan and Tommy with you again. Coming to you on Wednesday afternoon. Of course, that game we speak of is the All-Star Game. Tommy, that is the unofficial start to the 2022 season. G'day, Ryan. Exactly right. Always, uh, every year when it comes around, you kind of feel that the footy is just about back. And uh, we'll get into the squads in a minute, but it looks like some pretty good names to be watching next Saturday. Yeah, excited for that one indeed. Uh, Obviously here today to talk centre wings and front row forwards to finish off the last of our positional previews but uh, as we say we're pretty excited for the footy in 10 days time Tommy you mentioned uh, the squads there my first thought and I tweeted this yesterday sort of when I saw the teams come out is I thought that the indigenous side has put together uh, what looks a stronger side the Maori side probably not so much for mine but um, I guess the way it's looking next well for Saturday week I'm tipping the Indigenous side, just going off what I'm looking at on the paper here. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. Uh, Strong team by the Indigenous source, for sure. Names like Fafita, Katoni Staggs, they'll really be interesting watches for for a super coach lens as well as Nico Hines. Yeah, the Maori team probably doesn't look as strong, but I suppose in this exhibition format, you can never really be too confident on either side. Yeah, I think I felt that way the past couple of years as well. I think the team that I thought was going to win didn't, or at least I've been a little bit surprised by the end result anyway. Um, big news confirmed today as well um, that will play a role in that game. I think they're going to enforce it at that game anyway. The confirmation that the six again rule has changed now. This was tipped up in December, but I guess official word from the NRL today that uh, I guess the way that the six again rule will be enforced will change in 2022. Yeah, we've spoken about it a few times uh, and I probably like the change. I think last year, well, first of all, teams were just milking it constantly when they're defending their own line. But also I think it was just making the game maybe a little bit too fast and uh, the teams that were dominating in the game were just getting on a roll and it was impossible for the other team to make up any ground. So yeah, I think it might see a bit of a slower pace in the game and I quite like the change. Yep, and uh, you mentioned those squads there. Um, I guess we'll see a couple of the names that we're about to go through uh, in this uh, preview pod anyway uh, on Saturday night. Just one thing that I took away from the Indigenous squad particularly. Now, it looks like to me, and I could be wrong here, but just going off the squads, obviously it's just a squad and and not a team list as such, but it looks like for mine that Nico Hines will partner Braden Trindle in the halves. So... Those two potentially, with Will Kennedy at the back as well, they could put some real pressure on Matt Moylan heading into round one. You say it's an exhibition game, but three parts of the Sharks' spine there potentially could uh, throw some pressure on Matty Moylan. Yeah, it's a good spot by you. Um, Absolutely. Braden Trindle won't view it as an exhibition game. He'll be viewing it as a real audition to uh, fill the void through the whole season. Um, I thought it was pretty good last year in his time at halfback. Uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about Matt Moylan getting the nod ahead of him. So, yeah, really interesting to see how they all combine next week. And for the Maori side, it looks like uh, Nick Arima will partner Harris Tevita as well. So that could be a shootout for the Warriors number six to see who partners Sean Johnson uh, to start the year as well for the Warriors. Uh, Before we get into the bulk of this preview pod, let's just go over a bit of housekeeping as well. Um, Let's start with YouTube. That's potentially where you're watching us right now. And if you're not, feel free to head on over from your Spotify or Apple podcast stream. Um, Find us at YouTube. Just search Supercoach365. Or, um, as we say, keep up to date with us with our socials at Supercoach365 right across the socials. Tommy, we've been on fire on the socials. Um, plenty of interest around the content in the preseason, so it's exciting heading into the new year. Yeah, I think everyone's just so keen for footy, you know, and um, the fact we started pretty early this year, you know, we had podcasts coming out in late January. I think people were just happy to see some footy content and we'll just keep building towards the season. I know I'm so keen, so just doing these on a weekly basis or even twice a week, it's really getting me buzzed. Speaking about getting buzzed, uh, plenty are buzzed about this as well. This is our overall group code. We'll plug it again. Uh, Supercoach365 official overall group code. Uh, 
Might do some head-to-head leagues down the track closer to round one, but for now, join this group. Uh, code on your screen there, 576855. I think we're close to 500 entrants already. Absolutely free to play. It won't cost you a cent to get in and $100 to the winner at the year's end. Whoever tops most points come the end of the year. Tommy, I know you're in it. A um, little bit surprised, in a good way, how many people have jumped on already. Yeah, I mean, like you say there, the incentive, it's free to play. is a bit of money at the end of the year if you're lucky enough or skillful enough to be the top dog. But yeah, my uh, my team, the Doja Cats, they'll be uh, raring to go. <laughs> yeah, you and 499 plus others. Yeah. <laughs> um, the only condition on that, it's free to play, but just follow us on socials at supercoach 365 to be eligible to take home the prize at the year's end. Tommy, let's dive into it, though. We've spoken enough already. Let's dive into the centre wings. That's why we're here. And such a, a unique position in the fact that over the past couple of years, I don't think any supercoach position has maybe changed so dramatically in terms of its output um, than the centre wing slot. If you are the best of the best in this slot, you are rivaling the best of the best in the game, in fact. So um, it's interesting what we saw last year, and given those rule changes we've just spoken about, that may play a role here in in terms of lessening the output of centre wingers in 2022. Yeah, perhaps uh, last year was just really unforeseen by me. I I really prioritised, I guess, second rowers, as I said a few times, and I was burnt because these CTWs that we're about to mention just went ridiculously high uh, their averages was really something we haven't seen before from a ctw player so look whether or not it happens again in uh 2022 there's some really really standout options isn't there yeah there is and i think uh one of those guys it could impact we'll get to in just a moment but let's start at the top here of uh, i guess the pecking order for center wingers heading into the new season and Again, if we rewind 12 months and we're talking about Ruben Garrick as the number one centre winger, you'd probably think we've come from another planet and we've never watched rugby league in our lives. But that's exactly what we're doing here to start 2022. 24 games last year for Garrick, an average uh, just on 88 points, as we say, the best centre wing going off that average, but owned by just 5% heading into the new year. Now, number of factors for that one, Tommy, but if you could put your finger on it, why aren't players building their teams around Garrick. I mean, it looks a good option on paper. Yeah, it does. And if uh, Manly can reproduce what they did last year, he's sure to go well again. But I guess it's just a massive reliance on Turbo, isn't it? Pretty much everything Garrick did last year was all from Turbo's work inside him and Garrick was just putting the finishing touches on. He's a great goal kicker, though, and finisher. So that's two things that's not going to be taken away from him. But I, I don't know. You're kind of just banking on Turbo and Manly having a similar run. Because like you said, at the start of last year, like who's Ruben Garrick really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've we've seen him, you and I have seen him coming through New South Wales Cup with the, with the Dragons and obviously had a lot of potential and probably realised a little bit of that last year. I know uh, Brad Fittler's got a high rating on him, always been in the junior New South Wales squad. So just coming into his own, Ruben Garrick. Now, I d- dug out some numbers here, Tommy, and I want to get your initial reaction to this. And this isn't in the run sheet because I know it's a real reaction. You mentioned his reliance upon Turbo, Ruben Garrick, that is. If I was to ask you, now I think we said his average was close to 88. What was Garrick's average without Turbo in the team, do you think? I would have thought it's below 50, but that's just going off my judgment of him as a player on his mm-hmm. own. What is it? I think that's the misconception. So you said below 50. Uh, it was closer to 51. But still, I think if you're getting, if you told me that you're getting 51 week to week from your center wings, are you disappointed? I think that's the narrative that needs to change about Garrick this year. And, and to be fair, I was very surprised. I thought it'd be closer to 35, 40. No, that's a good point you make because like 50, 51, like you said, isn't a bad output. And then you factor in that's before even Turbo. And Turbo is obviously going to be a good player again. So yeah, you're making a decent case for him. And at just 5% ownership, he's almost a pot, isn't he? He is uh, 10 plus scores of, sorry, 10 scores of 100 plus last year. Five of those 120 plus. To put that into a little bit of perspective, Tom Travojevic had 11 scores of 100 plus. Now, admittedly, Turbo had some of upwards of 200, but just shows you that Garrick is one of those wingers, one of very few, that can go large. So, uh, singing his praises here, for what it's worth, I don't have him to start, and I guess the reason why I don't is I, I ask you that question: Are you happy with 51 from your winger? Absolutely, you are. But at that price, 
you're probably not. So given the tough start to the season for Manly, I'm playing around him early. Yeah, I think that tough start's a big factor too. I can't see him doing too much against the Panthers or the Roosters. Doggies round three could be a different story. But yeah, I just want to wait and see how Manly go, how Turbo goes before I jump into uh, Ruben Garrick. The concern, obviously, with Garrick is the reliance on scoring. You don't have that dependence from this man, Brian To'o, one of our favourites here on the Supercoach 365 podcast. Uh, 18 games last year, 84 points per game, second-ranked centre winger, owned by 13%. So you see that jump on Garrick, people more happy to dive into To'o at the higher price, given the fact that even when he doesn't score a try... He's probably more likely to walk away with a score 60 upwards than what Garrick would be. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. There, Garrick's probably a bit of a risk, as we just said, but To'o, to, however you say it, you Brand know to he's going... is the correct pronunciation, actually. <laughs> Thank you, with like eight R's. Uh, but yes, no, you know what you're going to get with To'o. Um, really going to be in a good team. His base stats are basically what a Ford produces... And then on top of that, he'll be on the end of some good attacking play and probably scoring some tries. So, yeah, it's hard not to have him, I think, in this slot. I said on uh, a mock draft that I did with Supercoach Whisper and Brew of the uh, Dual Position podcast and Tom of Fig Jam Sports last November, uh, talking Supercoach last November, um, <laughs> our opinions on to- oh, uh through the draft perspective, they differed. So... I think the Whisperer had him as high as 7th or 8th. I was keen on him 9th and 10th. And then the guys at the weekly rubdown even have him as low as 15th. So it just shows you, going back to the the point I was sort of saying at the start, center wing, this change in role and reliance upon scoring and change of rules in the NRL, it's just completely thrown out everyone's understanding of what is a good score for a premium center wing option. It has, but I almost feel like Brian is immune to that a little bit because of the way he plays. He, he reminds me a lot of uh, Josh Mansour back mm. five years ago, just like a real workhorse sort of winger. And uh, on top of that, like I said before, he's going to be scoring tries at the Panthers. So I don't think it really matters what happens with the whole CTW slot as a whole. I just think he'll have a good year again. 78% of the time he scored 60 or more points uh, to all last season at pure base of 42. So... I mean, you, you mentioned he's more like a forward. I think as well, um, I've said in the past that he's he's pretty much a front rower who scores tries, uh, Brian To'o. So um, the only concern then, I guess, in drafting To'o so early is given the new finals format in rounds, I think it's 21 to 24. Yeah, it would be. Uh, in finals weeks two and three, the Panthers play the Storm and the Rabbitohs. So just something else to consider for Brian To'o. That's a good point as well because... That's a really uh, important factor you need to look at because if you're looking to build towards the end of the year, it's all about who you, your players are playing against. And, yeah, that's that's two really hard games, but hopefully Penrith are in, will obviously be in the mix, you'd imagine, and I'll probably be trying to put their best foot forward ahead of our September. I wouldn't let that scare you off. I wouldn't let that scare you off um, taking To'o in early second round pick or even... Um, finding a way for him to get into your classic team sooner rather than later or at the back end of the year. Um, as you say, 78% of the time, so pretty much four in every five games, he's scoring 60 upwards. So essentially another forward, uh, albeit in your center wing slots. Mentioned that pure base um, for To'o. Now on the other end of the spectrum, someone who relies so heavily on scoring tries, but he does it so often, is Alex Johnston of the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Again, Get that price there, upwards of $630,000. That's not even bordering on premium price. That is premium price. That's Angus Crichton levels of price. Uh, 19 games last year, 73 average thereabouts. The fourth ranked CTW heading into the new season. But again, I think coaches are spooked by, I guess, AJ's reliance on scoring tries and what South's start to the year looks like and maybe how they factor in new attacking styles without Adam Reynolds. Yeah, all those points have turned me off him. I just, he's so reliant on that left edge and it's a great edge. Let's be honest, Walker and Latrell last year were just dominating and Johnson was just running five metres and scoring and picking up so many points. But does it happen again? Like Latrell isn't even there for the first two rounds. So that really will sort of hurt, I guess, Johnson's ball. Uh, Plus then you've got, 
their their early rounds, Broncos, Storm, Roosters, I think Penrith round four. So, yeah, I'd be waiting on Johnston. Just I just don't think he's going to produce big scores early in the season. I don't see how it will happen. Yeah, it's definitely tough, and I think that price will drop after three, four rounds. So if you want to play Alex Johnston, which I still think is a great option at different stages of the season, just given the way that Souths are going to set up with Cody down the left, Latrell when he's back, and... The ball is always going to Alex Johnston. Everyone can see it happening. You know what's going to happen. You look at play 3-4, you say, okay, Johnston's going to score the end of this set. Invariably, he does. That's just how good that left side is. Oh, yeah, you can set your watch to it, like you said. And there'll be periods of the year, if you look at the South Straw, where they've got a nice, easy run, that's where you're going to want him because he's going to score big then. Walker, Latrell will just get in the ball and he'll score. But I just think the first month, as we've said there, Latrell's out. Uh, for two of them, they've got four hard games. I'd just be, I'd be playing around him early. Yeah, and I guess another thing to consider is the makeup of South's back line this year. Uh, no Dane Gagai on that left side. And that's brought me to this man, uh, Campbell Graham. Now, I've got big raps on Campbell Graham, and last year probably not his best year there. 56.4 average, 18 games, and just owned by 1% of coaches heading into the new season. But... I'll put the case forward for Campbell Graham. I think he moves to the left side. I think he vacates that right centre role. He has played on the left before. He's done it uh, with some success. And I think this could hurt AJ even more because Campbell Graham, I think he's a run first centre player. He's not sort of your, you know, set up your winger type out and out left centre or right centre as it was last year. But I think that Campbell Graham can return to what we saw from Campbell Graham in season 2020. Uh, I think he averaged upwards of 60 that year. He was a try scorer. He had great base. I'll bring you up his numbers in a second. But can we make a case for Campbell Graham to replicate what Dane Gagai did last year? Because Gagai's numbers were through the roof as well. Yeah, I really think this is a good find from you. I really hadn't thought about Campbell Graham as an option. But everything you said there checks out. If he is named on the left, which which makes sense in a way because he's their next best back and that's mm. their strongest side. So you'd think they'd want a really good centre there and he really fits the bill. Uh, 56 average last year, that's not bad considering that they go left every time and he was on the right. So, yeah, I think that's a really good shout for you. I'll just go back to those numbers from 2020 uh, for a second. So end of season average for Campbell Graham in 2020, that is was 61 points per game. Now, that was up on his previous two seasons of 45 in 2018 and 2019. I just want to redo his last seven scores here to finish the 2020 season. Uh, So he scored 86 points against the Cowboys, 98 points against Manly, uh, 96 points against the Eels, 60 points against arguably the greatest team we've ever seen, the Melbourne Storm. 96 points against the West's Tigers, 78 points against the Bulldogs, and 74 points against the Roosters. That is just bulletproof. Campbell Graham to finish 2020. Yeah, well, you're making a great case for him here. Hopefully, uh, South's coach is watching, and he puts him on that left-hand edge because Gagai last year, case in point, he'd get the ball so often, he'd either get a try assist away to Johnson or he'd go himself and score. So if Graham can be in that spot... That's uh, that's a great price, one percent owned. It's a good find. Yeah, definitely. I think, and if he starts slow as well, and Souths are off the boil a bit, four or five rounds in, bang, that's when you hit. Um, that one percent might have even jumped off, and you could be one of very, very few who own Campbell Graham when Souths' run turns good. So, just something to consider. For now, I, I've tried to get him in. I haven't found the way, but again, once that price drops, I think he's really someone to watch uh, this season. Speaking of uh, someone around that 400000 price mark, let's move on to this man. Very popular pick. Uh, Katoni Staggs, returning from injury last year, played just four games. That average of about 62 points gets him in at the 43rd ranked at the slot, 41% owned. So he's been well found, Katoni Staggs. Yeah, I put him in straight away in the team picker, and then I noticed the other day 41% of people have. So it wasn't exactly... A- an amazing find as I thought it was. But um yeah, look, last year was a write off for him. He had a lot of problems on and off the field. Hopefully he can sort that out because I really think he think he has great potential. I've always been a big fan of his. And you know, there's a good vibe around the Broncos this year, we think, with a few new signings and whatnot. So I'm hoping he can put his best foot forward, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Um 
as long as he can stay out of trouble, like you say, because I think he is the superstar. He's the marquee man um, in an attacking, try-scoring sense anyway. He's going to be on the billboards next to Adam Reynolds and Kurt Capel probably selling Broncos tickets because he is someone who gets fans through the gates. Just looking at his price there, I think that's more than half of the reason why people are so keen to jump on him. Uh, 40, what is he, sorry, he's $433,000 thereabouts. That's a 49.7 average. So he's already 12 points, well, a 12 point discount you're getting um, going off that average. And I think he's someone who could easily average 60 again without too much fuss because he is such an explosive player who can bust tackles. And I think Broncos will be improved, as you say. Yeah, I'm hoping so. And he's going to be, him and Payne Haas are going to be, you know, focal points of that team and I just think if they're going any well at all he's going to be scoring tries and making tackle pass and line breaks so he's a bit of a risk but at 433,000 I think he's worth the risk definitely yeah and everyone's in well I mean four out of every 10 super coaches at this stage are going to have him as well so if he does flop early at least or close to half of all coaches are going to feel the same pain as you um, now he's he's the not a pod I guess you could say he's owned by everyone but I want to get into some more pod picks Tommy because our Instagram has been lighting up with comments and, and questions in the DMs and rate my teams and such about pods at center wing because they are going to be hard to come by this year with Sawali so highly owned Panasini highly owned uh, Stags as we just mentioned but I think I've found one I think I've found a pod here owned by just one percent. Now, I will put an asterisk on this and say that he's only a pod if he starts round one. Obviously, he's not, he's not playing. But someone, whoever fills this slot, it's either this man, Rocco Berry from the Warriors, or his counterpart in Jesse Arthurs, whoever wins the race to the right centre role. Now, uh, purely at the price there, Rocco Berry, eight games last year, 36.8 average, um, just owned by 1%, as we say. But look at those fixtures to start the year there. The Dragons, the Titans, the Tigers, we've been over it before. Love the start for the Warriors, first three games. Now, uh, go through his stats a little bit deeper, Rocco Berry, not a big name. But two injury-affected games of those eight last year. Uh, Take those out, because I think one of them he might have played a handful of minutes, and the other one, uh, yeah, just about the same. He averages 49.8 in those other six games. Now, for mine, uh, we'll do the maths here in, in, in just a moment, but purely playing for those first three weeks, make some cash, flip in with maybe a trade boost heading into round four, I think you can pick up 60, 70 grand there from nothing, really. I really love the research because when you first mentioned Rocco Berry, I nearly fell off my chair because <laughs> I thought he'd be a trivia question in 10 years about remember that Warriors player that played eight games. But Remember that pod Ryan spoke up that scored 16 <laughs> and 15 and 2 in rounds 1, 2 and 3? <laughs> no, nah, look, I think the biggest question is, I agree with all your points, but the biggest question is whether he gets a start or not because there, at, from memory, at the back end of last year, there was a lot of backs in the Warriors team. I don't know what's going on this year heading into the side. Nathan Brown is an odd coach. He seems to make some weird decisions with his team picks, but hopefully for your, uh, your sake, uh, Barry is there. And if he's not, maybe the other man who could be there, I'm not sure. I've already spoken up um, Graham as a potential pod, and I said, I, I you know, put a caveat on that. I said, I don't have him, but I actually do have Barry at this stage. So money where my mouth is for now. Rocco Berry is in my team. Make no secrets of it. Uh, the other man I spoke of was Jesse Arthurs, who's similarly similarly priced. Um, you know, six in one, half a dozen the other there. So interchange. I just like that right side. I think SJ will, will go down that side. We've seen him in the past with uh, Britton Nakora and uh, Jesse Ramian at the Sharks. I don't think the, the first three opponents for the Warriors are defensively that sound. He's probably up against, um, well, geez, he's going to be left center for the Dragons. Couldn't tell you, to be honest. Um, Talatau and Moan, perhaps, depending where they fit him into the team. Then up against Brian Kelly in week two, who is known to struggle in defense. Uh, and then against the Tigers, who themselves struggle defensively week f- three. So I'm just saying... Whoever fills that role at the Warriors can make some cash early. And that's purely what it is. Just at the price, make some cash, hit and run mission, get out. 
Yeah, no, you've, you've sold me almost. Oh, I've got SJ in my team for those sort of reasons you said there. I just think they've got a pretty easy start. Let's be honest, Dragons and Tigers games are quite, you'd expect them to win or be, at least be favourites. And then the Titans game isn't too bad either. So, yeah, whoever is in that slot at the price they are, you have to think, like you said, just get in and get out, make some cash. So already, just doing the maths there, he's 12 points discounted on his average from non-injury affected games, which... I mean, you pray he stay in, stays injury-free those first three weeks, and then what happens after that, you can make your mind up yourself. That's a pod. Now, let's jump into someone who's not a pod. Um, this man here, Joseph Sawali, who uh, is owned by Plenty, um, and I guess it's no surprise why he's so popular with super coaches. And, again, that price is the reason why. It is, but I don't know. It just depends. Does he play? There is so many options in the Roosters back on this year. It's incredible. Um, Billy Smith, Kevin Naguama is a pretty random signing, but I've heard from a few sources he's a good chance to get a run. Mm. Paul Momorowski's there. You've already got Manu and Tupo. I, I don't know. I'm Suwali had this massive boom on him for the last few years. He's been the talk of the town. He played a few games last year, was okay. He's now finished school, so maybe Robbo is going to throw him in. And uh, 58% of teams, that's one of the highest ownerships I've ever seen. Yeah, I think it's he's currently the the most popular pick uh, across all positions, Joseph Suwali. Um, was he a flop last year, Tommy? Question on notice. Was he a flop? I think maybe that's too harsh on Suwali, but I think definitely... The hype was about Suwali when probably it should have been about Sam Walker. Or Reese Walsh last year. I think those two went obviously better than Suwali, but it's hard to knock a guy. He was only, what, 17, 18. He's still finishing school. Mm. Like, it's not his fault that the media fell in love with him and fell in love with the South Coast Rooster story uh, surrounding his signing. So it's not really his fault that everyone put him on this massive pedestal he still played pretty well if any other rookie had to come into grade and play like that we would have been like that was pretty good it was just because yeah. we had these ridiculous expectations of him. Uh, Roosters I'd say it's a, a fair start to the year uh, games against the Knights Manly and then uh, you'd have to remind me who their the third round is Souths uh, Souths that's right um, well storyline fitting there for Suwali if he gets the run but as you say it's a stacked Roosters back line so that 58% ownership, that can very quickly drop to 50 come Teamless Tuesday if he's not named. I still think people will hang on to him, but I think some will discard him and find someone else who's playing that week. Well, they, yeah, this team, the Roosters, and I think also the Raiders, they're another one where Teamless Tuesday is going to be big for the backs because both those sides, there's a lot of decent backs there. For the Roosters, you got Billy Smith, Nagama, and Momorovsky is a bit more expensive, but whoever gets named in there, I reckon they're a good shout. Also with the Raiders, we don't have the graphics here, but players like Tomoko, Sebastian Chris isn't too bad, Harley Smith Shields, they're all decent workhorses. If they get named in the team, come round one, I reckon they could be good, uh, cheap options. If you're listening to this, you can guess who the Raiders fan is because Tommy's just rattled off about <laughs> six, five or six players who probably turn out for the New South Wales Cup team this year. But um, no, you make a point. Depth is a blessing at both of those clubs. Just quickly on Momorowski before we wrap this up and move on to the front rowers. Interesting signing. Uh, former Rooster returning to the club. Similar story to Connor Watson. Does he play centre? Does he play wing if he gets a start? Where's his best spot? Is it left or right? And more importantly, is he going to kick goals? Because I think that's what everyone who's got him in their team is pinning their hopes on at the moment. Not sure about the goal king situation there. Um, I think he's a good signing, though. He was really good at Penrith last year. He forced his way into an already gun team and won a comp with them. So that's yeah. awesome for him. He comes back to the club where I think he started at the Roosters. Um, I'd have him in the centres, but I think he's a lock to be in the team somewhere for sure. I think he's been at five clubs at five years and three of them have made the grand final. Um, so phenomenal. He's just the, the Midas touch, Paul Momorowski. Um, Tommy, that wraps us up. For our centre wingers, um, I'm sure we could go on for hours because it is such a deep position. So if you do have some questions on any of those players or any others that you'd like us to run the eye over before the season starts, you know where to find us at Supercoach365, either inbox us or um, tag us in comments and such, and we'll be sure to get back to it. Tommy, let's take a short break. On the other side, we're going to chat the big boppers, the front rowers. Having a bet on the racing this week? Top this. With tops. 
these top odds are guaranteed. Place the best of the best multi during Saturday Metro meetings for the top flux or dividend from the best three national totes. Plus, there's best of the best to win up to five grand too. Top that. Download the app today. Top Sport. Feel the excitement. Don't let the game play. You stay in control. Gamble responsibly. Welcome back. Supercoach 365 podcast, of course, brought to you by topsport.com.au. Once again, in season 2022, great to have the support of uh, the Top Sport gang up there in Queensland, Tristan and the team. Uh, shout out to you guys. All the best for season 2022. Tommy, just on the, the racing there, something our listeners might not know is you're a keen racing fan, um, more so the, the trotters or the pacers, but uh, tell us about this horse you've owned. I think it's it's going all right. Yeah, uh, Will to Excel is the name. It competed in last year's Jericho, a uh, big race down at Warrnambool worth 300K. Uh, Going to resume in about a month's time in Sydney. So, yeah, look out for it. It loves a distance racing. So if you see Will to Excel, think of me and have, have 10 on. Gamble yeah, responsible. Do it. Do it. <laughs> 10, uh, 5, 10, whatever you can afford. Obviously, uh, bet with your head, not over it. Um, but we'll be sure to follow it. Maybe it can be the official horse of the Supercoach 365 podcast, Will to Excel. Um, hopefully we can find you some winners along the way uh, with that one. Tommy, enough of that. Let's get into the uh, front rowers here because um, speaking of uh, a bloke with a motor like Farlap, Payne Haas. Now, he's the best of the best here. Now, statistically, maybe not. He comes in at rank number two. But uh, that's because of Isaiah Papali'i, of course, his dual position eligibility. Um, we'll bring his numbers up here. Payne Haas, incredible uh, what he can do. 74.5 points per game from 18 games last year. In fact, says he's the third ranked. Uh, I think he, he should be second ranked there, but uh, 54% owned. I'd say it's a fair start to the year for the Broncos, but Payne Haas, sort of like Brian To'o, doesn't matter if they win by 50 or lose by 50, his scores are probably going to be uh, pretty consistent along the way. Yeah, exactly right. I think that's probably why 54% of teams have him. I was surprised at the ownership, but uh, when you think about it more, it makes sense because last year he was great in a pretty bad team, the Broncos, and we we're all expecting them to be a bit better this year. So he looks a good option, let's be honest. Uh, the Rabbitohs to start, then the Bulldogs and the Cowboys. I'd say that's two of three uh, pretty fair fixtures for the Broncos. I, I think they'll be much more competitive. We spoke about it with Stags uh, in our centre wing preview uh Payne Haas now and his first full season there without uh Pangai Jr by his side so might pick up a few more minutes uh Carrigan will come back as well uh Bullymore is gone so a few of these middles that the Broncos just moving on or coming in as well um but Payne Haas he really is their forward leader and I think it's incredible that he is given he's just I think he's 23 24 years of age but plays well beyond his years he does, and like you've said there, they've lost a few forwards. It was a really competitive forward pack at Brisbane, and still is, but Haas is the leader of the pack, and the older he gets, you'd hope, you know, the more, I guess, mature he's going to become, and you'd expect that to translate into good super coach scores, and I think that's why everyone's just sort of jumping on the bandwagon this year. Um, we, we have a look there. Now, he's priced at that average of 68.3 uh, or 4, close enough. Um, but that price, are we expecting that to rise or are we happy to just plug him in from round one and keep him until origin and then make our minds up? Because for mine, I think he started last year upwards of 640000 I'll have to double check that, but that seems like a price cut to start the year. Yeah, I can see him going above and beyond that average, really. I can see him getting 70s and 80s to start the year. Oh, he's not someone I'd be trading in and out really i think i'd just be happy to pick and stick obviously injuries in form you have to be mindful of that but all things considered uh he's just someone i'd like to lock in in front of row forward i don't really take too much time to think about this position on it's probably the, the slot i care about the least front row yeah. forwards but uh someone that's just going to churn out good scores I, I don't know how you say no to that Yep, um, pretty solid there. I already sort of mentioned him there beside him, but obviously at a new club this year, we don't have uh, the graphics here to go by it. But uh, Pangai Jr., uh, I think at the at Pangai's price, given his new role, 
maybe his minutes change whatever but I don't think he's so minutes dependent because he is so explosive and I'm going to make the first of a couple of bold predictions this year but I'll do it right now I think that Pangai Jr. actually finishes up as the best front row option this year even though he's probably playing on an edge for the dogs but I think he's just I think he can be better than Haas and that's no mean feat because Haas is incredible yeah, I do think if I'm not going to get paying by for reasons I said the other day, I just think he's a bit of a risky commodity. But if I was going to get him, I'd probably rather go him in the front row forward slot rather than the 2RF. Um, I think you did the numbers and you think that's better also. So, yeah, I really can't disagree with what you're saying there. He's a good shout for this slot. Yeah, for what it's worth, I have both of those guys, uh, Haas and Pangai. I just think at their price, they're probably, well, you know what you're going to get from, well, you know what you're going to get from Haas and I think, the expectation of what you could get from Pangai is enough to, to earn him a spot in my team to start the year anyway. Um, but that hasn't stopped me from including this man, who again was somewhat Mr. Reliable last year, Luke Thompson of the Bulldogs. Of course, we'll play alongside Pangai this year. Uh, some great numbers from Thompson in his first real full season as an NRL player. Dual position, cut price there um, when you compare it to well, I guess he's slightly cheaper than Haas, but what we get out of Thompson in 2022 could be very different to what we saw last year for reasons beyond anyone's control. Well, look, this is this about the vaccination status you're talking about here? Yeah, I think I think he's anti-vax, or he was at least, or he was on the nose at the dogs. There was just these rumours going around that he, he might not be at the club or they were trying to move him on, then they weren't, and then is he going to play, is he not? I I don't know where, where to sit on Luke Thompson at this stage. The last thing I saw, I think he did get vaxxed, but look, don't hold me to it. I'll do some more research later, but I'm just going to assume he is vaxxed, he's going to play. And if he is, I'm really surprised he's only owned by 4%. Um, Payne Haas, 54%. Luke Thompson, 4%. Now, I'm in the 54% with Haas, but there's no way that he should be 50% more owned than Thompson. Thompson last year stood out in a terrible team, the Bulldogs, one of the worst teams we've seen. They're going to be better this year with a lot of good-name players. You'd think he should be the beneficiary of that, So I'm, and he's dual position, so I'm surprised he's only 4%. Yeah, I'm sort of with you. I can sort of see... The hesitancy to dive in without having watched trial footy. Obviously, Paul Vaughan comes to the club. What does that do for his minutes? Josh Jackson played through the middle at stages last year. Um, Jack Heatherington there as well when he plays 10 minutes before he gets sin bin. Um, so take nothing away from what we saw last year from Thompson. But I think... I agree with you. 4% is far too low. Maybe mid-teens, 20% would probably be more fitting. But... That, that number could easily change in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, there are some factors there. I still think he's good enough to you know, be holding down a, a good amount of minutes to still churn out some good scores. So, look, I don't have him in my team, but I can't really say why I don't, honestly. I just probably just backed Haas over him, but I really think Thompson's mm-hmm. a good option. He's a pod, really, at 4%. If you want to go against the grain, take on Haas, put in Thompson. He probably doesn't, again, just comparing him to Haas at the price and, and all things considered, he probably doesn't have that attacking stat in him. Although saying that, towards the back end of the year, I think he was one of their be- one of their more attacking threats, Luke Thompson. A couple of line breaks spring to mind, maybe even yeah. a try. Um, but yeah, I mean, comparing the two, it's probably not exactly fair, but I agree with you. Um, I think that number will jump from 4% in a couple of weeks' time. But again, that's a wait and see after the trials. Uh, next man, who probably doesn't get the raps that he should as well, maybe like a Thompson, but I think he's he's going to become, this season especially, known as one of the best front rowers in the game. And I don't say that lightly with uh, this man, Mo Fotuweka, uh from the Titans. Probably not the, the sexiest player in that Titans forward pack. You look at Fafita and Tino taking much of the headlines. But Fotuweka, what he brings to this team, owned at just 1% by all super coaches. I think... Um, he'll have a stage this year, Mo Fodawaka, when he becomes very super coach relevant. Yeah, 1% is incredible there for Mofo. Um, looking at his scores last year and the year before, averaged 60 in both those seasons. That's great for a front row forward, really. Um, Gold Coast pack, really good, isn't it? For Fida, Tino, Fodawaka, hopefully, will be starting. And then you've got players like Joloff on the bench as well. So great pack there. He's only young. I think he can turn to a real leader up there. 
I'm with you. One percent really, really makes me want to kind of get him. Yeah, and I guess comparatively at that price, you're probably looking at uh, Christian Welch, like for like. I think Welch is around five hundred and nineteen thousand. So uh, there's probably more upside, I think. And I know Welch is a representative player, but so too is Fodawaka. And you mentioned those other two names. They've almost got the Queensland pack, the Titans. And they're collecting the set up there. Um, but in saying that, I think Fodawaka towards the back end of last year, and you might want to just have a look at this, Tommy, but I think his attacking stats was through the roof. He, he proved a real force, and, and sort of like a Fafita, in those moments, they went to Fodawaka, or Fodawaka had the potential to make something happen out of nothing. A um, couple of scores over 80, I think, towards the back end of last year, and shows you that on his day, he can be dynamic like a Haas or like a... Uh, Stefano Yutukamanu, who, who improved his form towards the back end of last year. Yeah, he was better at the back end of last year. Not not a massive amount of attacking stats, but I do agree with you. I do remember him sort of being a bit of a focal point in attack, a bit of a ball playing forward at times. So I think he has that in his game. Um, and yeah, like you said, there the Queens, the sorry, the Titans fork back is star studded, and he can just be a part of that. And yeah. Um, Really surprised at the one percent, but I guess like we've said there, you've got pretty good options in this stock with Haas and Thompson ahead of him. Yep. Um, again, it's sort of that awkward price because you're not sort of paying, you know, seventy thousand more to have Payne Haas. It's probably safer to do that, and I say safe because you're obviously yeah. playing with fifty four percent of other um, super coaches in in that aspect as well. So, um, not a bad pod though if you want if you want to go uh, down that route. Um, anything else here with uh, Mofo or even uh, Tino from the Titans, who's under 500k? We we don't mention him here in our graphics, but is he an option dual position? This time last year, he was a very popular pick. He was, and uh, I owned him for a bit of last year in draft competitions. Um, just bringing up his scores now, he he was a bit hit and miss. Uh, some games he score 80, and then other games he score 30. Uh, I don't know. I kind of got a little bit sick of him. His average by the end of the year was only 56, so I don't know. Probably I'll probably go around rather mofo. Yeah, I think there was that hesitancy from a lot of players last year. They thought he was too reliant on his try scoring at the Melbourne Storm before he went to the Titans. And as you say there, he has those games where he goes big and invariably he, he busted the line or scored a try. But um, definitely a pot option at 490000 thereabout. Uh, still on the pod train, we'll continue this. Um Owned by just 6%. Now, I thought this number would be higher, to be fair. Lindsay Collins of the Sydney Roosters. Six games last year before he had that ACL injury. Uh, 58.7 average, not to be sneezed at. Six, uh, 23 uh, position rank there. We've spoken of the Roosters' start to the year. Uh, we think it's more than fair uh, for those first three games. Uh, $460,000, Lindsay Collins, one of the best-priced players to start the new year coming back from an ACL though that's the asterisk on that but um, at the price Tommy could you make a case for Collins because again like those other names we've already mentioned he is a Queensland front row as well yeah when I first did my team uh, almost a month ago now with the team picker I did have Collins and Haas but then I realized how hard it was to fit everyone I wanted in my side I had to get rid of Collins just to save up some cash but I do think he's a good shout um nearly 60 average last year in just six games before getting injured. He was starting to really announce himself as, you know, the leader of the pack of the Roosters, probably going to take over from JWH in that role. So this could be his, you know, breakout year. And I, if I can fit him in, I will, but I just don't know if I can at the price. I just remember that game against the Broncos. It could have even been the back end of 2020 when he was just the best player in the field. I think he played 80 minutes that night. Scored a try, broke the line, seemed to make tackle bus every run he had. Um, so that's his potential. That's probably his ceiling. But on that night, I think he scored upwards of 100 super coach points. He might have, I think he got man of the match, Channel 9 as, as well. Um, so we know what he can do. Obviously, there's a bit of reluctancy to, to dive in there coming back from that injury. But in a great team, you mentioned taking over from JWH as the forward leader eventually. Um, as it currently stands, I, I don't know the stocks of the Roosters' middles. There's obviously JWH, Collins, Takayahau, and then probably not too much beyond that. It's mm. probably Renoff or Tony, but I can't really think of the now now front rower to to challenge them for minutes. Yeah, you've got Fletcher Baker, Egan Butcher. I can't remember if they're front rowers or second rowers, but uh, no, Collins definitely gets first crack at starting there, probably with JWH. So. 
look, I can't say a bad word about him really. He just got squeezed out of mine due to salary cap reasons, if you will. But um, he is, other than Haas, he was my go-to. So, yeah, I really like Collins. I like the Roosters overall. So, yeah, big ups from me. Yep, uh, another player on the rise like Collins uh, is this man of the West Tigers. He was the cheapie at this slot this time last year. Uh, Stefano Itukamanu, uh, 21 games for the Tigers last year. Probably played more footy than what we expected him to. Uh, probably says more about the Tigers than how good Stefano was playing. Um, take nothing away from his back end of season form, but there's probably that period there where he did his job and not too much more. But that was enough for super coaches to, to make some cash. And clearly enough, um, going off last year's form to, to justify a quarter of the game owning him heading into the, the new season. Yeah, he was a bit of a unknown, wasn't he? Started last year, I didn't really know who he was, and then he burst into the scene and he became probably one of the the game's most exciting young front rowers. He was in the Origin camp, was he not? With Freddie, yeah, uh, scored six tries, so he had a really good year. And there's no reason why he won't again. He'll probably go to another level, another year older, another year in first grade. Another good option in this slot. Let's be honest. His future settled now as well. I think they just signed to a four year deal. Uh, the West Tigers, so good, great buy for them, really. And I know it's easy to to knock the Tigers, but that's a good piece of business. Um, you, you say here in the notes he should spearhead the Tigers pack. I think absolutely, and and sort of like that Painhouse mold. He came through. Uh, you mentioned the Origin camp there, but he's come through the Junior New South Wales systems. Uh, I think he's even captained one of those teams on occasions as well. I like Painhouse, so. I remember when they signed him from the Eels, he was, it was a real, for the Eels, a case of the one that got away. So for super coaches this year, plenty to be excited about. I think uh, for, for now, I don't have him. I know a lot of people who I've seen in the super coach community and Instagram and YouTube and such, they do have him. They've got big wraps on him. So I'm not going to begrudge you if you have him to start the year. I almost wish I could fit him in, but but at that price, it's I just can't. Yeah, it's the same pretty much to the words that I'm out there. If I could fit him in, I would, but only two slots really in this in this position. So I have gone around him, but I do think he'd do a job and he's a good uh, good draft pick perhaps. Yeah, smoky. Um, don't give too much away with your draft picks, Tommy, because I'll come for him. Uh, <laughs> last one here. Now, I don't think this guy's a draft option, but certainly relevant in the classic game to start the year because he will do a job for the Warriors, and that's Aaron Penne. Numbers on your screen there. A little bit like... You took Amano this time last year. Relatively unknown. We've, we've got a small sample size of what to go off. We've seen him at the Melbourne Storm in those origin-affected weeks or weeks where uh, players have been out injured, suspended and such. But Aaron Penne heading to the Warriors. Nine games last year, 33 average, owned by 13%. So compare those numbers to proven names like uh, Luke Thompson, who we've already spoken of, uh, 4%, or Fodder Waker, 1% owned. Super coaches are coming for Aaron Penne. Yeah, I, I this was a, a shout I put out probably when we started doing talks about Super Coach a month ago. I just remember seeing some games at the Storm last year. I really thought he showed some potential, and obviously the Warriors saw this too by signing him. But I am just a bit scared that will he get the game time he wants to get? You've got Matt Lodge and Adam Fanua Blake there at the Warriors. You know, two pretty good forwards. Um, where does Penne fit into the team? I know Toe Harris, he won't be back at the start of the year, will he? So maybe that does open a slot for Penne. Yeah, I think the latest as of the uh, last couple of days, Tohu Harris, about round 10, we're expecting to see Tohu. So uh, that's 10 weeks. But you mentioned those names there, Lodge and uh, AFB. They play huge minutes, don't they? Well, they yeah. can when they're not suspended. So I think Lodge could be suspended. I mean, he's always suspended, Matt Lodge. <laughs> he is out, I think, the first one or two rounds after that ridiculous game against the Gold Coast at the end of the year. Um, but yeah, he'll be back and then he'll command a starting spot. So maybe without Tohu there, Penne could play lock or second row. But uh, yeah, team this Tuesday will be interesting for Penne. He's in my team at the moment with a hope that he can get a spot. But if he doesn't, I'll have to do some chopping and changing. Yeah, and I think plenty will go off team this Tuesday. For that, you mentioned the Warriors there, how they shape up to start the year. I don't know, is it current on an edge? Is it current at lock? Um, that will determine Penne's minutes as well. Um, some questions. We'll get to those after this break and particularly around some other cheapies at the front row forward slot. Uh, don't go anywhere. This is the Supercoach 365 podcast. Having a bet on sport this week? Top this. 
Whether you're into cricket and curling or golf and greyhounds, Top Sport will let you on for plenty. And with literally hundreds of markets from your own backyard to the international stage, Top Sport has you well covered. So if you want to get the top odds every time, bet with Top Sport. Top that. Download the app today. Top Sport. Feel the excitement. Don't let the game play. You stay in control. Gamble responsibly. Yeah, welcome back. Uh, let's get into those questions right away. And the first one, we'll, we'll just dive in. Blake's Brushworks. Uh, Blake loves a question. Front row forward cheapies. We've already mentioned Aaron Penne, but have you got any more, Tommy? Because I think it's going to be a spot where we are happy to plug in someone at that 200 to 250, 300K price tag. Yeah, I do think it is a slot where you could find some value and a lot of it will come down, as we just said, to Teamless Tuesday, who gets named where. But perhaps this is a pretty high ownership as well. I, I can't remember the exact figure, but it was pretty high. Tepa Morale from the Storm. Yeah. I think with uh, Nas, Nelson Sofa Solomon, I'm probably not going to play this year due to the vaccination status, which is incredible in itself. Uh, that could open up a slot, obviously, in the front row. And that could see Morrell get some decent minutes. He showed glimpses at times in his career. I think of the Eagles initially, wasn't Yeah. I mean, he had that season there that he was just... He was almost like the Papali'i of the time, Isaiah Papali'i, that is, where he just was sort of that no-name but just burst onto the scene and could score tries <laughs> and... Anyway, did his job as well. That was admittedly six or seven years ago. I still think he's fairly young. Had a stint in rugby uh, with the Waratahs. Comes back to Melbourne last year. Limited game time. I agree with you there. Moiroa, et cetera, uh, I won't say a huge year with the Storm, but definitely he'll play a role down there. Um, another one here, George Burgess for mine. Um, 247000 Again, I think he'll be a popular pick. And I don't think you sign George Burgess not to play him in the 17. I know they've got Aaron Woods and <laughs> Laurie and all these other types, but I, I, he's got to be there somewhere. His best is good enough, let's be honest. This, when they won the comp, and this is, what, eight years ago now, he was best front row in the game, arguably, but... Look, I don't know about the Dragons. Uh, they've got a lot of similarly sort of ability front rowers. Mm. Where does he slot in? I don't know. I'll just wait till the, the first week of the season and see if he's in the team. But, yeah, if he does make it, not a bad shout. I think the Burgess name just gets him a spot on the bench. <laughs> I don't know. He's no That's, Sam. No, he's not. And, and going well. I mean, he's got a... He's got a um, he's got a... I think he's got a metal hip now as well. So he might not even be Tom. Go on. Although we've wow. seen how uh, we've seen Tom with no kid on, so they might be similar. He's a married man now as well. Sorry, we shouldn't say that. Um, anyway, uh, last question here. Actually, sorry, there's two more here. Uh, Pat Salby and Amani Bowden asks, jumping back to the centre wing slot, Daniel Tupo as a pod. Great question. Uh, I mentioned that Roosters backline before, Tommy. This is probably one player besides Tedesco who you know is going to start round one. Yep, he's a lock for the Roosters. He's been a lock for the last eight years. He no, never lets them down, never lets you down as a super coach commodity also. And if we think the Roosters are going to go well this year, he's going to be on the end of a lot of attacking play. So, yeah, why not? Yep. Um, and you think Kiri back won't hurt Tupo as well, that, that crossfield kicking, we've seen that before. Um, yeah, I, I like it as a pod, to be fair. I don't know his price, so... If it's mid four fifty, say five hundred, then maybe you you look elsewhere. But um, hmm. he's going to be scoring tries, sort of like an Alex Johnston, though maybe to a lesser degree, reliant on scoring tries. His base is solid, but I think that sort of went away last year with the six agains. Um, but in twenty twenty, I think he was a good option, about sixty points per game thereabouts. Uh, last question here from Chris Laidley, friend of the show. Asks us, hey guys, well, this is more of a statement than a question. Hey guys, loving the podcast this year. I can't wait for the trials. Will you guys be running a tipping comp this year? Um, initial reaction to that says maybe, but uh, at this stage, no. Speaking of tipping, Tommy, um, our friends at Top Sport have put together a great tipping app. Uh, it's called Top Tipping. Let me just double check that before I plug the wrong app. Top Tippers. Um, <laughs> tippers. Top Tippers. So if you are playing NRL tipping this year or uh, you'd like us to set up a league, more than happy to do so. We'll be doing it through Top Tippers. Uh, might set that up some stage this week and post that out across the socials as well. So essentially Top Tippers, uh, I think it's it's not a head-to-head, not a one-for-one one split. I think you get the odds. So if you tip uh, the Outsiders, say the Knights round one, you'll get about four points. You tip the Roosters, you'll get 1.2 points going off the odds at topsport.com.au. 
Tommy, that was a big episode, close to an hour. Um, it was plenty of fun. Chatted CTWs and front row forwards and a couple of questions from the listeners amongst all of that. Thanks for your time, mate. Um, plenty to look forward to. That's the last of our position pods, but plenty to look forward to on the Supercoach 365 podcast. Absolutely, mate. Last of our uh, position pods. It's been a good talk. A uh, month out now. We're going to be into the trials next week or the All-Stars game. We'll start some... Uh, Team previews, I think, is our next table throwing. Absolutely. Can't wait to dive into all of those. 16 teams to get through as well. But before that, we've got some all-stars to watch. This is the Supercoach 365 podcast. Don't go anywhere.